is up, youth? Welcome to Eschatology 101. That's right, we are trying to get a lay of the land of the Bible in order to clarify our view of the end of the Bible. So, you remember the word, right? Eschatology? Meow. Yep, just go ahead and meow. Meow. Eschatology. It just means the view of the end. Now, I find it most helpful to really enjoy the end of a story when I've got a sense of the whole story as a whole. So we're going to start at the beginning again, and we're going to trace through the biblical narrative of family. So would you join me in the chopper? The chopper! Yes. The chopper! Let's get in the chopper. Get in the chopper. Get in the chopper. All right, I'm trying. I'm trying. What I mean by that is we're going to actually climb up a little bit and go quickly through the landscape of the Bible, focusing on this particular narrative thread, the narrative thread of family. We're going to spend quite a bit of time in what's called the etiology. Yeah, yeah. Yes, another ology word, etiology. Yeah, yeah. No, maybe that makes you think of eating, but an etiology is actually the study of the beginning. Uh. Etiologies wrestle with the questions of why things are the way they are. And in order for us to understand God's end game with family, we must understand why the family of God is so divided. And in order to understand God's narrative and his end game, God's end game is way better than Thanos' end game, by the way. Yeah! With the theme of family, I think it's good to spend a lot of time in the Bible's etiology, namely Genesis chapters 1 through 11. And we'll, of course, go beyond that as well. Fam, would you join me in this exploration of fam in the Bible? Humanity has its start in family. This title being made in the image and likeness of God, you see it in Genesis chapter 5 as well, but it's a connotation of kinship that we indeed are part of the family of God. And very rapidly you see that God wanted his people, his new family, Adam and Eve, to fill and multiply. What would this mean? This would mean the growth of the human family. Against all other ancient Near Eastern creation stories, Genesis stands alone as it describes all of humanity in kinship relationship. In other words, all of humanity is one family. And further, a family being made in the image and likeness of God, well, that meant that they were going to represent God's interests to the world. That's right, this filling and multiplying the growth of the human family was actually supposed to carry out the growth of God's kingdom. What amazing divine partnership the human family was tasked with at the beginning in the etiology. We've covered the fall in every one of these stories, but you know that humanity decided for itself what was good and evil. Would that compromise the family? Would that affect relationships within the human family and threaten the project of God's kingdom growing in the human family? You better believe it. This incredible clip from the movie Noah helps us to capture the effects of the brokenness of the human family played out through every generation. Every conflict, every personal struggle, every fight between nations, between peoples, between tribes, between races. This is all part of the legacy of the brokenness of a human family. This is in us, my brothers and sisters. Whether or not we want to admit it, the fall has touched us all. The first brothers, Cain and Abel, one of them murdered the other. You see, the idea of moral autonomy, choosing our own good, humanity often chooses self-interest over the interests of the family, over the interests of God. And we're terrible at it. This is the fracture of the family of God. And it repeats over and over and over in the biblical narrative. When you look at the lineage of Cain, the original murderer, instead of amplifying and refracting the kingdom of God, we see that the kingdom of broken relationships is amplified. And Lamech parades his violence and his mistreatment of others as if it was good. This is the wrong kind of kingdom building the family of God is doing. 
And yet, in God's mercy, he allows the human family to flourish. By the time we get to Genesis chapter 10, we see that the whole human family has indeed become a table of nations. The genealogies in scripture connect us to one another. And God's grace, even in the frustrated, cursed human family, the fallen family, God is moving forward. But what would he do? Well, in Genesis 11, we see the human family attempt to come together. But this isn't the kind of family togetherness that God wanted, the kind that would amplify his kingdom. In fact, it would only amplify their broken kingdom. They call it the Tower of Babel, and they intend to make their own reputation greater. God knew in his wisdom that this kind of kingdom would indeed not be the kind of kingdom that would keep the human family together. In fact, it would be something that would perpetuate their alienation from God and one another. So God scattered the human family as a means to bring about their redemption. But just how would he bring the human family together when they were scattered apart, confused and frustrated in their efforts to be together? Well. He would do it through a family, and an unlikely one at that. Enter Abraham and Sarah, an elderly couple, unable to have children. God would give him a family that was so big that would outnumber the stars in the sky or the sand on the shore. And in fact, this family would be a part of the blessing of the entire world. Every people group would be touched by God's work in blessing this family. This family would become the family of Israel, a family that was representing the kingdom of God, that God had drawn near and invited the world back into the family of God. And as excited as we are to read all that, well, Abraham's family ended up being a lot more like Adam's family than maybe he had hoped. See, every generation actually struggled with contention among the family. There was Isaac and Ishmael. There was the conflict between Jacob and Esau. And there was the conflict between Joseph and his brothers. It seems every generation is heartbreakingly playing into the legacy of the original family rather than living up to the restoration of God's covenant family. Just trace through the history of Judges and First and Second Kings and you'll find heartbreaking failure after heartbreaking failure as God's people fail to embody the kind of family he envisioned in the garden. If even the covenant family could not represent the kind of kingdom God saw, how would the family of God be restored? I bet you guys know where this is going. Way back in Genesis 3, God promised a deliverer to be born in the family of God. And guess what? God himself would be born into the broken human family. Woo! Jesus. I know it is easy to skip over the genealogies in the Bible, but guys, this is so important. Did you know that God was keeping the promise of the human family alive by entering it himself. Indeed, Jesus is this family member they were waiting for, their kinsman redeemer, the good brother, the real firstborn. And he would embody the kingdom of God like humanity and its brokenness could not. You see, God the Son himself became our brother and in him we can find the restoration into the family of God. He didn't come for his own interests, he came in the other interest That is what we call love. His sacrifice gives us a way back to become really human again. Rather than the dehumanizing legacy of Cain and Lamech, we become truly human, truly in the family of God through Christ Jesus. True family, then, is found in Christ. And we see the family of God picking up the vocation of Israel. God's project is not over. His kingdom will come through this family. And that is the redemptive narrative we find ourselves being invited into as part of God's family, the church. 
The New Testament is filled with kinship language as God redefines family, not by tribe, not by ethnicity, not by lineage, but by commitment to Christ himself. This is the new family, the new hope for God's kingdom come into the world through Christ. And yet, if you're a student of history, you may realize that the church hasn't done well here. That, in fact, many of the times, it seems we carry the legacy of Cain and Lamech, where we're not embodying the love and the character and the family of the kingdom of God, but in fact, are at each other's throats. Further than that, the church has done horrible atrocities to other people and other people groups. Christians and the church have been a part of crusades, conquest, genocide, boarding schools, slavery, terrorism, holocaust, hate. Why has the church participated in dehumanization rather than the growth? Of the family of God. When Christians lose sight of God's intent to weave the human family together, they advance another kingdom altogether. But you'll find the opposite of that to be true as well. When Christians do stay focused on God's intent, amazing and beautiful things can and have happened. C.S. Lewis asserts, if you read history, you will find that the Christians who did the most for the present world were precisely those who thought most of the next. It is since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world that they have become so ineffective in this. Guys, we've got to keep our aim at God's end game. Men and women carrying the vision of Christ have shaped the world. Christians and the church have been on the frontiers of caring for the human family. Orphanages, hospitals, efforts for literacy, humanitarian aid, resistance against regimes, and the advocacy of justice and the global advancement of missions. Christ is working through the church and redeeming the human family. In the mixed bag of history, the church indeed has grown the family of God. And we wait for eschatological fulfillment. John the Revelator sees this, God's plan fulfilled. He says in 7-9 of Revelation, after this, I saw a vast crowd, too great to count, from every nation and tribe and people and language, standing in front of the throne and before the Lamb. This is the eschatological family of God. All of the human divisions gone before Christ the King. One day this will be the case for the church. One day this will be the case for we who hope in Jesus Christ. God's goal is to heal his family, to humanize his family around the presence of Christ, his kingdom come in fruition in full. We will be restored as the family of God. Until then, we await with this hope. I hope you see that God indeed wants you in his family. That's part of your identity, your ideology the origin of who you are. You were made to be in the family of God. God gives us that choice. Would you be adopted into the family of God? Would you be adopted into the story of God? And guys, in the time being, as we think about the end game of God, we find ourselves in a place where we have that decision to make. My hope is that you'll see the redemptive arc of God that you'll see this story as something you can adopt and that you would indeed choose to participate in it and aim at the eschaton of God's realization of his family restored. He's working that among us right now, church family. Let's partner in that effort and be family together. So I hope this is encouraging, I hope this is helpful. And for the next three weeks after this, we're gonna be looking really camping out on the end of the story because there's a couple things we need to understand about how the end of that story not only is it taking shape and we're understanding god's intentions and motives but that we also understand that the end of the story is pressing into the present and it applies to us right now it's something we're going to be trying to think through as we look at the resurrection as we look at inaugurated eschatology and as we set our hopes on the new heavens and the new earth and if all of that sounds a bit lofty to you just stick with me we'll 
explore this together. I think it's time to park the chopper and we're gonna camp out at the end of the biblical story for a few weeks. I can't wait to dive into it. Next week, we're gonna look at the first glimpse into the end of the story and it's gonna look a lot like Easter. Let's celebrate the resurrection together as we explore the story of God and how its ending is coming into our lives, even as we speak. All right, Godspeed, fam. <laughs>